This week on Q&A, our guest is Warren Brown, Cars columnist for The Washington Post. Warren Brown, you've written about automobiles for over 30 years for The Washington Post. First question, how involved is the U.S. government in determining what we drive in this country? Very involved, if you look at it from a regulatory viewpoint. Uh, you have safety, you have uh, emissions controls and that sort of thing. Most of those things are determined by, in terms of the goal of reaching you know, an emissions point or a fuel conservation point. Those things are determined by the federal government. Now, how uh, the car companies reach those goals is pretty much up to them as long as they reach them. Uh, and so safety affects structure, uh, uh, you know, uh, interior, you know, development, uh, emissions control affects what happens on the, you know, after treatment, uh, you know, of, of exhaust. Uh, uh, and the whole fuel economy thing uh, affects everything from the shape to the overall size and mass of the car. So uh, the government is really very involved. How did you get started reviewing automobiles? I had a very wise colleague at the Washington Post who told me that if I wanted to make it at the Washington Post, I had to develop a franchise, find something that no one else was doing, uh, and do it, and live with it, uh, try to love it if I could. Uh, and uh, so that's what I did. Uh, when I first, I was on a national desk uh, at the Post when I petitioned to join a business staff, much to the chagrin of my uh, national desk editors who thought that I was throwing away my career, uh, you know, by doing that. But I, I also was lucky enough to uh, have friendship with the Frank Swoboda, uh, who thought I was crazy, but he gave me space to be crazy. Uh, and so that helped. But when did you then first get interested in automobiles? I've always been interested in automobiles. I mean, I grew up in New Orleans uh, in the 19, uh, late 1940s and uh, 50s and 60s, uh, when I had to sit at the back of the bus, certainly in the 50s. And it always bothered me. Uh, it always bothered my father. Uh, you know, boarding a bus and having to sit behind a sign saying uh, no color, you know, beyond this point. Uh, freedom came with my parents and black neighbors who bought their own cars. That way they, they could not only sit up front, but they could drive the things. And that to me was power. You know, that to me was freedom. Uh, cars have always meant more to me than the sum of their parts. They were a way to escape, you know, see other worlds. They were also a way for me to see my parents in charge of something rather than sitting behind a sign. How did your parents explain to you back in those days why this was, uh, there was a division between white and black? They didn't, really. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story about how, my, how our parents you know, reared us. We went to Catholic schools uh, you know, in New Orleans, mostly Josephite and Blessed Sacrament schools in New Orleans. Uh, and I came home from high school, from St. Augustine High School one day, complaining to my father, who was, you know, a scientist and a researcher for the National Science Foundation, also a teacher in New Orleans Public Schools, complaining to him that the priest, uh, one of my priests, was, was a racist. This happened to be a priest who taught me uh, a geometry, uh, uh, geometry and chemistry. And so my father didn't say anything. He just told me to get my uh, uh, chemistry and my geometry books. And he says, well, show me where you are, you know, in these books. And I showed him, and he, in the chemistry book, he wanted me to work some formula. I couldn't do it. He didn't say anything. He says, show me where you are in geometry. And I showed him, and I couldn't, it was not up to snuff, you know, in geometry. And he looked at me, and he said, the priest might be a racist, but you're stupid. And as long as you're stupid, it doesn't matter if he's a racist. So don't ever come home and tell me that he's a racist unless you know how to do the work. And that was a lesson that had just basically stuck with me. And that sort of sums up the entire way my parents dealt with you know, race in New Orleans. It was, yeah, it exists, but it's no excuse. Uh, and we don't care uh, if somebody calls you, you know, an N-word or any of this kind of crap, uh, if you don't know what you're doing or if you're behaving improperly or if you aren't trying you know, your best. 
Uh, and so that's how we were reared. Um, some people might call that, you know, bourgeois or close-eyed. You know, I call it, you know, I call it a blessing uh, because it taught, it's how we reared our children as well. Uh, not to base your life on what someone else thinks of you, but to base your life on what you think of yourself and what you want for yourself and what you are doing for other people, you know, as well. It's, it's how we were reared. What did you do differently after your father said you were stupid? Uh, one thing, I never came home and told them that somebody was a racist. Uh, or if I had a complaint, I made sure uh, that I had researched a complaint thoroughly before bringing it to him. Uh, it was sort of like the best defense was to know what the hell you're talking about before you start talking about it uh, in, in his house. And so um, I studied. That's what I did. You know, I studied. I stopped worrying about uh, how the... Uh, uh, what I thought the priest thought of me or didn't think of me, and I started try to, trying to figure out what he was actually trying to teach me uh, in the uh, academic subject matter, you know, at hand. So I studied. That's what I did. Did, did I read, I, and I don't know whether I read it about you or not, that you that blacks couldn't take communion in the same church as the whites? There was. It, it's amazing how this church has changed. Um, we used to live in the lower ninth ward, uh, and um, the, there was a church there, St. Mary's uh, Catholic Church, uh, I think around Roman Street or uh, one of those streets down there. Uh, and we could attend that church, but we normally, by tradition, had to stand in the back of the church, um, you know, behind the whites. Uh, the whites would have communion first. I always thought that was wrong. Uh, and so I was a cheeky little fellow, and so I would go up to communion with the whites. And sometimes the priest wouldn't serve me communion until the whites were served. Uh, my late brother Daniel Thomas Brown, Jr., uh, would clunk me in the back of the head after Mass, saying, you're trying to get us killed, you're trying to get us in trouble, you know, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, normally to avoid that, we went to black Catholic churches, uh, which were our true parish churches, uh, now defunct in many cases, Holy Redeemer. Uh, Catholic Church, just right outside of the uh, French Quarter. Uh, you know, we would go there. Those were black Catholic churches, um, mostly uh, run by uh, Josephite priests uh, and uh, uh, Holy Ghost nuns, Blessed Sacrament nuns, Redemptors, and people like that. Did you ever ask any priest or confront anybody in that church as to why you had to stand in the back and then why you had to take communion after the Yeah, I did. Uh, and, and it was kind of like, you know, it's just basically, it, it's custom and, you know, you have to learn obedience. And I said, I have to learn any kind of obedience. Uh, but, you know, unlike, uh, and I don't mean this by, it, it, as a put down, understandably, a, a lot of blacks who grew up with me, who were baptized Catholic and who grew up uh, uh, with me, uh, left the Catholic Church. Uh, largely, even people in my own family. Uh, you know, I never did. Uh, and I married a woman uh, who never did because we never really identified the teachings of the church with uh, the way some people practice, you know, the teachings. So uh, we were able to separate that. And we also had, I had, you know, good training. I mean, I remember uh, once, it was on a Good Friday, as a matter of fact, at Holy Redeemer. Uh, and we had, I think the, the nun was a Sister Mary Vincent. Uh, and uh, we had, you know, gone to morning mass, uh, you know, before going, you know, back to class, and we're falling out of uh, falling out of the church in our, you know, Holy Redeemer uniforms, and white kids in the park across the street, which was a white-only park <laughs> across the street from this church, uh, started calling uh, Sister Vincent a nigger lover. Seriously, uh, we took offense to that. Uh, and, you know, several of our number charged across the street and got into fisticuffs with this thing, and it was a kind of a knockdown thing. We thought we were heroes. We got to the classroom, and she told us how disappointed in us you know, she was, that we had learned none of the teachings of the church, nothing about forgiveness, you know, nothing about, you know, turning the other cheek, that we behaved as hooligans first and Catholic second. And she would have none of that. <laughs> I got to tell you, when we, when I we first asked you to come to the interview, I thought we'd talk about two things. That yeah. Mostly, mostly the automobile stuff. Or two, I might as well throw this into the mix right now: the kidney operation. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. you know, it's like I tell, 
uh, I, I've had two kidney transplants. Uh, one from my wife and one from a very good friend and wonderful colleague of mine, Martha McNeil uh, Hamilton. Uh, uh, both transplants have now gone kaput, as sometimes happens with you know transplants. Uh, Martha's uh, is still functioning in me, but not well enough to keep me off of dialysis, and that's going on about maybe nine to ten years. Uh, what it's taught me is that you'd better try to take advantage of life now. Uh, you better try to figure out what's important now. Uh, what I have learned this lesson another way, without going through all of the, you know, pain and you know suffering of you know end stage renal disease. Yeah, probably. Uh, but I don't regret it. Not not one bit. Well, go back. When did you have the operation? Uh, the first one was in 1998, and that was my uh, wife's transplant uh, a gift to me. Uh, my wife, Marianne, uh, and the second one was in 2001, which was from Martha Hamilton, who is a, you know, you know, one of the funniest, but at the same time, sternest people you'll ever meet. You know, she just came up to me. You know, we worked together for a long time. We're friends. And she says, look, dummy, you need another kidney, right? And I said, yeah. And she says, well, I have two. You can have one. <laughs> and it went, it went on like that. Uh, and that's, you know, typically Martha. We did the book. Uh, I think you may have a copy of it there. I do, uh, yes. You know, black and white and red all over. We did that book together uh, in 2001 um, uh, at the behest of the Washington Post, as a matter of fact. Uh, and we probably uh, will have to revisit that. And I suspect that we probably will. Well, you mentioned now, how, how long have you been back on dialysis? Uh, almost two years now. Yeah, almost two years now. Did the other kidney fail? It stopped functioning as well as it should be functioning, primarily, and, and, and that, of course, uh, can create other problems. And so to avoid those other problems, we uh, it chose to go back on dialysis. So yeah. are you going to have another transplant? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I have my um, youngest daughter, uh, Kafi, who is a medical reporter for New York One, uh, who wants to give me her kidney. Uh, I'm now 62 years old. Uh, I'm doing quite well on dialysis, you know, this time around. I don't know if I want to put another life of someone I love, and I love both of those women, m my wife, Mary Ann, and, and Martha. Of course, I love my daughter, you know, Kathy. I don't know if I necessarily want to put another one of them, you know, at risk when I'm actually doing okay. How uh, often do you have to go for I dialysis? go three days a week, but, you know, it's manageable. The only thing, the only thing that going to dialysis uh, has... Uh, uh, meant for me is that I had to do something that Martha and my wife Mary Ann and Louie Hammond, who's a friend of mine out in California, have always criticized me for not doing, which is planning. Uh, for example, like I'll be at the Paris Auto Show. Uh, I'll probably do dialysis at the American Hospital, you know, in Paris. In order to do that, I had to plan now, you know. And so the only thing this disease has done is make me grow up, <laughs> really. Uh, you know, before, uh, I mean, I have, a, you know, an assistant, you know, Rio Manglapus, who just basically shakes her head because I never really tell her anything. She just kind of, like, figures it out. Um, and so now I've begun to tell people things. It makes life easier for me, for them, and for everyone else. I, I can't... Um I read your book, and I can't uh, go without asking you that something I learned in the book is that if you have kidney transplant, they don't remove your other kidneys from your body. No, I'm a four-packer right now. <laughs> you know, all atrophied for the most part, but I have four kidneys somewhere in me. Yeah, yeah. Does that surprise you when you learned that? No, because uh, it's a re it, re removing anything, you know, from the body it involves another, you know, piece of surgery, and so... Uh, the medical profession, in its infinite wisdom, would prefer not to have to do an extra bit of surgery if uh, it's not bothering you. And they don't bother me. Uh, they apparently have shrunken or atrophied or something. So You know, as long as we're talking about this, we have a clip from a Politics and Prose uh, talk that you and, and uh, you, the, your donor uh, had back in November 17th of 2002. Why don't we run that okay. and see what you look like back then? <laughs> 
I no longer worry about dying as much. Uh, if there's one thing you worry, if, if, if there's one thing you learn when you go through something like this, is that you're going to die. Um, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not the operation is successful or not. And so then the question, of course, becomes, uh, you know, how well do you live? And that's a much harder question to, to, to answer. Uh, and so I've been spending a lot of time lately trying to answer that. And the, you know, the shorthand that I come up with is basically you try to, you try to love. Uh, and, and, and live and work as, as hard as possible in the time, uh, in the time you have. And, um, you know, you don't make a big deal out of it. I mean, you just basically, you know, you, you go on. Yep. That's, that, that's still, I don't know how, if I look the same, but, uh, but that's still my, my thinking. As a matter of fact, I believe it even more now than I did back then. So the book, as you said, is titled Black and White and Red All Over. Yeah. Uh, for those that have never heard that, wh where does that title come from? Uh, it's a, it, it's a, a joke that we used to have in Catholic school about nuns, you know. Uh, you know, it's awful, you know, nun hit by a car, black and white and red all over. But we just changed the black and white and, you know, red all over, meaning that Martha is white, I'm black, uh, but we're, our internal organs are all covered by the same, you know, colored blood, if not, you know, the same type. They also used to say that about a newspaper. Yeah, black, black and, and white and red, red all over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what impacted either the whole experience um, from the race standpoint have on your life and, for that matter, Martha's life and the book? Well, uh, the impact of race was that my siblings and I uh, certainly... We had, I had six brothers and sisters. We now have, uh, uh, we're now a, a sibling group of four. We could not have had better parents. We could not, honestly, I think about this every day. We were lucky in our choice of parents. Uh, I had a father who had every reason to be angry, to be an angry black man. Uh, he served in World War II, fought in World War II, uh, was a medic, uh, a U.S. Army medic. I uh, came home, tried to get into uh, medical school, uh, Tulane University, LSU. Those schools down there then were not, you know, accepting, you know, blacks uh, in their classrooms. Um, uh, went to Xavier University, you know, pre-med, what have you. Uh, then she's now called St. Catherine Drexel, but Mother Catherine Drexel uh, took him, uh, you know, under her uh, wing. Uh, he became a teacher in uh, Catholic schools in uh, Louisiana, uh, teaching science. I think, he, if I recall him telling me, that was she told him that if he couldn't become a doctor, now maybe he could train future doctors. Uh, and he took that to heart. Uh, you know, he taught you know science in uh, Catholic schools in Louisiana. Then he taught science for a long time uh, in the Black New Orleans public schools. Uh, and the funny thing now is that uh, even now, uh, even when I'm overseas uh, and I may wind up in somebody's pharmacy in Belgium or France or something like that and I see a black person behind and I wonder if they came from the United States and in one or two occasions, uh, you know, in France they actually came from the United States and I said, well, where'd you grow up? And I said, you know, you know in, in New Orleans. And I said, do you know Daniel Thomas Brown Sr.? And he said, yeah, he taught me at coin. You know, both of our senior high school down in New Orleans, and it's it's just the greatest amount of pride that he chose not to hate. Uh, he chose to take um, well, Saint Catherine Drexel's mother, Catherine Drexel's, uh, uh, you, you know, guidance, and he did train you know the black doctors and pharmacists of the future, and that's a very special thing to me. So uh, you're sitting at a dinner party, and somebody sitting next to you uh, has an opportunity to talk to you. Do they ask you what your favorite car is, or do they ask you about your kidney operation? Uh, usually what my favorite car is. And my, my, my response is, I don't really have a favorite car. My favorite car, I'm a, an automotive gigolo. Uh, my favorite car is a car of the moment. Right now I'm extremely uh, interested in... Uh, alternatively powered, you know, electric, uh, you know, electric cars, uh, you know, gas electric models. I love diesel. Uh, so my favorite car is one that can give you the most horsepower, the most torque, uh, with the least fuel consumption. 
uh, you know, you give me a car, you give me a car like that, and, and, and you know, and I'm happy. Who builds the best cars? Everybody now builds very good cars. Honestly, I don't know if you can say best. Uh, people were getting on Toyota's case uh, recently, past you know during the summer, uh, primarily because uh, Toyota. Well, they discovered that Toyota was human. They discovered that Toyota can make mistakes. I had known that all along. I have been saying that for the past 10 or 12 years. They make mistakes. You don't believe me? Look at what Toyota consumers say in Japan. But in the United States, we somehow had given Toyota the mantle of infallibility, that somehow they didn't make any errors, which was nonsense. Toyota's problem isn't that it just started losing a grasp of its quality. Toyota's problem is that it started losing grasp of its myth of infallibility. It had always made mistakes. Uh, the media had always ignored them, by and large. Um, and so, as a result, did our government. Uh, you know, Toyota is as good as Toyota has always been. It also <laughs> makes as many mistakes as Toyota has always made. General Motors, uh, which was always the bad boy uh, of quality, they did have bad quality. They made you know, lots of errors. The error wasn't the physical error. The error was the management error of pretending that you weren't making mistakes when you had consumers out there suffering and being arrogant about it. It makes people angry, and when they become angry, they remember that for a very long time. The current GM is not at all, you know, the old GM. And the current GM wasn't just born in 2008 or, or when we had the, uh, uh, the financial uh, fallout. The current GM actually started coming about in the late 1990s when they actually started paying more attention to quality. They started paying more attention to basically how to please you know, their consumers. The cars that everybody, the GM cars uh, that you see now that everyone is, um, uh, you know, that people are raving about, it didn't just happen in 2008. That started happening 10 years ago. The question is that now that they've learned, they being GM, now that it's learned that painful lesson, you know, will it continue under the new management? Will it understand that the car is a thing? Here's hoping <laughs> that that's the case. How yeah. many people do what you do in, in American newspapers? Hmm. It's hard to tell, uh, honestly. I, I wish I, I, I could uh, give I mean, you an answer. But I'm not looking for a number so much. There are not very many, are there? No, not very. Uh, you know, and I, I'm an odd fish. Dan Neal, uh, I guess he's at the uh, New York Times as an odd fish. And, uh, Healy, uh, 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 at uh, in the USA Today, I think you know. We all, you know, the three of us have this idea of <laughs> the car industry is not just the sum of its parts. It's not just the latest in, in, in new thing. There's a, you know, a movement, you know, in, you know, going on here. I I bring all of my uh, historical baggage, you know, uh, in, you know, to uh, to coverage. People say, well. Why are you so willing to give General Motors uh, and, and Ford a break? Well, I mean, it is personal, but I have no, no problem admitting it. I'm willing to give GM and Ford a break because they were the companies that gave my people a break. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it is arguable, I think justifiable, to have an argument to say that we would not have a black middle class had we not had General Motors, Ford, uh, you know, and Chrysler. Uh, you go to Detroit today to the old uh, you know, auto automotive neighborhoods. Um, the difference in those neighborhoods uh, and, say, 1950s, 1960s, is that the blacks who were working in the plants then, they did have a dream. They wanted their kids to run the plants. You know, they wanted their kids to design the cars uh, and to be lawyers and, and so forth and so on. Uh, and that's what their kids became. Uh, one of our chief uh, foreign correspondents at the Washington Post now uh, is a guy, uh, you know, who grew up in a UAW family. Um, you know, it's, uh, so, did I have a affection for those companies? Yeah. 
Now, does that affection translate to uh, turning, uh, turning a blind eye to their feelings? No. As a matter of fact, I think I was probably more harsh on them, you know, for their feelings uh, than people who fancy themselves as being, you know, so-called, you know, objective and not having any feelings for those companies. Because to me, we're throwing away our legacy, not only our legacy as, you know, uh, you know black Americans, but our leg legacy as Americans, period. I mean, the idea uh, that you would throw away manufacturing superiority uh, because you're, you know, you're just chasing bucks and you don't really care what you're producing. You know, the idea that you would throw away leadership uh, and innovation infuriated me. I mean, it, I was angry with those companies for, you know, for a long time, but at the same time, I was also willing to give, uh, you know, to give them a break uh, once I was convinced, as I became convinced. Uh, that you had people there who actually cared about turning out, you know, top products. I, I tried to f find all kinds of numbers, and uh, I'm not going to trust any of them. So I'm going to ask you if you can help on this. Mm. Um, which country in the world today manufactures the most automobiles? Uh, I think you'll have to say, you know, Japan, but mostly for uh, mostly for export. Uh, uh, China is coming up very fast. Uh, you know, we're still, you know, in there, but, you know, not nearly as much as we used to be. How do we relate to China? In other words, how many Americans are over there or, or companies are over there building automobiles? Uh, practically every, with the exception of Chrysler. Uh, certainly Ford uh, and uh, General Motors are there. General Motors is one of the, if not the biggest company, uh, you know, in China right now. Buick is the best-selling nameplate, you know, uh, in China. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until I went to Shanghai you know, then I realized that there could actually be something called a good Buick. <laughs> you know, I'm over there, I'm looking at these Buicks and I'm going, I don't get it. You know, why are you guys making great Buicks here, but you're making lousy Buicks at home? Uh, and it all had to do from their telling uh, what, what the Chinese market demanded, what the Chinese buyer demanded. Uh, I mean, if you could afford to buy any kind of a car, I mean, it says something about you. It was a whole face thing. Uh, and saving face or honoring face is a very, was a very important thing. And oddly enough, GM of China stepped up to it while GM North America was sitting on his tail, not doing that. So now what happens is that GM North America and GM China, at least in mindset, are one, which is a good thing. Uh, because now we're getting Buicks like the uh, like the new LaCrosse and the you know the new Buick Regal, which is an excellent you know mid-sized car. Uh, and I all credit uh, GM China for somehow transferring its culture uh, to GM North America and re reinvigorating GM North America. How far have you traveled to see the automobile being manufactured? <laughs> <laughs> I've been all over the world. It's one, one reason I love this job. I've been, all, all, I've been to Kazakhstan <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, you know, been all over Kazakhstan looking at cars, um, you know, all over, uh, at least not all over Russia, but, 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 but certainly, you know, you know uh, Moscow and, the, you know, St. Petersburg and places like that, you know, looking at the automobile industry, uh, you know, Brazil. Uh, uh, looking at, at production uh, in, in the car industry down there. It's a fascinating industry. You know, Western Europe is kind of like a second home. You know, Germany, uh, you know, Germany and France, uh, yeah, Japan. Uh, it's a fascinating industry. And all of that travel, uh, whoever said that travel is the best way to eradicate your biases knew what he or she was talking about. It's the best way to eradicate your biases. You know, uh, yeah. right after the wall came down, we traveled over to Germany, and the first thing you saw in East Germany were those Trabants. Mm. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't remember exactly what. I think you had to wait something like 13 years, and it cost you 10 grand to get one of them. And they were two, were, two strokes, and they'd... They were awful. But five years later, you went, mm. we went back there, mm -hmm. and they were gone. Yeah. And then you had the Ladas. From, yeah, from Russia. Well, you see a lot of the Ladas in Kazakhstan, obviously, and in, in, in Russia. But an, an interesting story about the Trabant. Uh, about the, two years after the war came down, I went to Munich uh, to do some interviews with the uh, BMW. Uh, and 
there were about maybe three or uh, four little white turbans, trabbies, I guess you'd call them, uh, you know, outside of the, you know, BMW, you know, headquarters. And so I asked one of the execs at BMW, I said, what's, you know, you know what's with the turbans? And they said, oh, those are people from East Germany who are coming over applying for jobs <laughs> uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, you know, BMW in Munich. And BMW, the, the exec said, the BMW exec said he could not, the, the company could not hire many of them because it was really just culture shock. I mean, BMW is, I mean, they're just constantly just going, you know, all the time. I mean, you don't stop, you know, you don't fall back, you know, something breaks, you fix it. I mean, that's just the way, I mean, it's just constant pressure uh, that apparently some of these guys from East Germany, you know, weren't accustomed to or if, you know, something broke, something fell down, you know, uh, it, you know, f shut down the line and come back the next day. Didn't happen at BMW. <laughs> so in your job, though, um, how do you protect yourself from being schmoozed to death by all these car people? Uh, people like you, uh, you know, readers, seriously, uh, buyers. Uh, I see myself as a servant, not as a journalist, you know, no, per se. I see myself essentially as a servant. Uh, and I am serving those people out there who are buying cars and trucks. I am their servant. Uh, and that basically means, you know, I have to keep them happy. A good servant basically keeps the people being served happy. I have to keep them happy. Uh, I have to look out for their interests, and they tell me what their interests are. I can't be anybody's boy, you know, from a manufacturing you know, viewpoint. I, I am, you know, their person. I have to serve them. Uh, and so they keep me honest. Uh, if they don't like something, uh, they are not the least bit cherry about letting me know they don't like something. Uh, if I run um, a whole bunch of uh, expensive cars, say three or four in a row, <laughs> hey, knucklehead, do you realize it's a recession? We can't afford those cars. What are you doing? You know, write about something that we can afford, please. Like tomorrow, you know, do it already. Uh, and so I listen to them. And so they keep me honest. Uh, my readers keep me honest. Uh, the buying public keeps me uh, honest. If they don't like it, they let me know. Uh, and if you're smart in this business, you'll listen to them. What's your take on General Motors as 60% uh, owned by the American people? Well, if they weren't 60% owned by the American people, we wouldn't be talking about General Motors, would we? Uh, so uh, it was a shock, you know, to see, you know, the company go into bankruptcy, but it was a shock that you get over with, you know, over really quickly. I wasn't really worried about GM going into bankruptcy because I knew uh, the work that GM had been doing on new products the past five, six, or seven years. And I like those products. I like that, it, 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 you know, that product schedule. It was a different general, by, by, the time, <laughs> by the time GM sends caught up with it to put it into bankruptcy, it was a completely different General Motors. And this is what I mean by that. The spirit at the place had completely, you know, had completely changed. Uh, there was a time when when Frank Sabota was uh, working with me covering the automobile industry, you know, we would go to, uh, you know, to Detroit to do, to do interviews at, you know, GM, and you could hear the shutters coming down. Hey, those guys from the post are in the building, you know, cut it, cut it down. Uh, uh, we couldn't speak to engineers or stylists without having a feelings of GM public relations people, you know, around us. Nowadays, the stylists are calling you. The engineers, you know, are calling you. Uh, we want to show you what we got. In, in, you know what we're doing. There's, you know, there's a sense of pride uh, at the place. You know, they really believe in what they're doing. Management finally has uh, gotten common sense enough to understand that if you hire someone to be an engineer, maybe you ought to let her be an engineer. Uh, you know. Let her do her best work, you know, uh, and uh, and and pay her for it, you know, encourage her. So that GM, that's a GM that actually went into bankruptcy, but that GM was actually paying for the sins of the father, paying for the sins of of of, of, of the old GM. 
poor Rick Wagner, uh, G. Richard Wagner, the guy, you know, he really did everything he could possibly do. And I'm not saying it because he's now on the board of the Washington Post, but he did everything he possibly could do, uh, putting most of his emphasis on improved product, improved product quality, improved products, pouring billions of dollars into it, you know, taking lots of loans for it. Uh, and that part of Wagner's reign was successful. The part of Wagner's reign that was a failure was he was too nice a guy. He just couldn't bring himself to shut plants as quickly as they should have been shut. He couldn't bring himself to get rid of divisions that should have been gotten rid of. He couldn't bring himself to fire people that he probably should have fired. Uh, and so he got fired. It's not a fair life. What's your take on why Ford uh, didn't have to get money from the government? Because when you are already head over heels in debt, which Ford was at the time of the financial collapse, you're not exactly going to rush out to put yourself in more debt. Ford had mortgaged everything, including its blue oval. Uh, so that's one reason why they didn't do it. The other reason is that Ford had the good fortune of failing before GM and Chrysler. Uh, and it had the common sense of listening to whoever said, okay, we have to bring in new management. And they brought in Alan Mulally. Uh, and the company then had the common sense to leave Mulally alone and let Mulally be Mulally. And he cut what Ford management didn't want to cut. Uh, he threw out what they didn't want to throw out. Uh, he borrowed lots of money. Uh, poured it all into new product. Uh, that new product is good product, excellent product, and it was just beginning to come out just as the recession hit. Uh, and so, one, Ford couldn't borrow more money. They were too heavily in debt. Uh, they had actually fixed the problems that got them into trouble. Uh, and could they have used the government's money? Yeah, but they were wise enough to say, um, no, uh, we, didn't, we, we don't want to do that. And so they got the favorable blowback uh, on that, which is, um, oh, look, you know, Ford can do it. The problem was Ford had almost gone to bankruptcy long before General Motors. Uh, they were in turmoil long before General Motors. They had fixed all of that. They had borrowed their way into new products. Uh, couldn't, couldn't borrow more money and uh, were smart enough not to uh, take the handout that was offered to them. Looking back on Chrysler, why did uh, Daimler first buy it and then why did Cerberus, uh, the financial operation, take it over and then why did Fiat get into it? Uh, ego is, is the one answer to all of those questions. Just plain ego? Plain ego. Uh, look, when Daimler bought First of all, Chrysler had been trying to shop itself around almost since I started covering the beat at the Washington Post back in the 1980s. Uh, uh, Chrysler had been shopping itself around, you know, you know, looking for a part. Uh, it's uh, Eads, uh, uh, Eaton, rather, Bob uh, uh, Eaton and Iacocca had done, uh, I should say Iacocca and Eaton, uh, had done a good job of making Chrysler saleable bringing Chrysler back, you know, using the bill-out money, the first bill-out money back in the uh, 1980s, bringing Chrysler back uh, and uh, uh, developing a good portfolio, uh, making Chrysler a renewed moneymaker. Daimler Chrysler, uh, the management at, at Daimler Chrysler then thought, oh yeah, yeah, we, we can use Chrysler to you know, to expand in the United States and, you know, put our mark, you know, everywhere, except that you had the same thing that happens in a dysfunctional family. You know, uh, sisters A, a and B, you know, they go off and they, you know, they go off and, you know, they're doing everything they should, should do. Chrysler is the, is, is the problem child, but now you're bringing Chrysler into the family. You had people at Mercedes-Benz who swore, we will have nothing to do with them. You know, we will not give them our engines. We won't give them anything. 
we want we, we want no Chrysler near anything that says Mercedes Benz. And so it was a dysfunctional family. And it was just all purely you know, purely ego. Uh, now comes uh, Fiat. Uh, I've always said, and I still contend, uh, that the only reason Fiat wants Chrysler is because of Dodge, you know, because, because of Chrysler's trucks. You know, Fiat doesn't really have entry into the truck market, and the truck market is going to start going again as the economy starts going again. Uh, Fiat's uh, uh, entry into Chrysler gives it some of the best pickup trucks in the world. Yay for Fiat. Uh, you know, the media looked at it as, you know, Chrysler now needing small cars. Well, yeah, Chrysler needs small cars, so great. You know, Chrysler gets the Fiat 500. It gets the Fiat 500 when gasoline prices in the United States have done this again. They've come down. It makes the Fiat 500 a little bit less of a deal, uh, you know, in the United States uh, for Chrysler. Um, but it makes those big Dodge trucks a great deal for Fiat. So 10 years from now, uh, project from what you've seen uh, about oil, gas, and the electric car, and I know you're, <clears throat> I've seen you write not so many uh, great things about the Prius. It's a lot of puffery there. Well, put it this way. The, the Prius is not so much puffery as is the idea uh, that Prius technology, gas electric technology, is the answer, you know, to our uh, energy conservation problems. It's not. Uh, when you look at, you know, uh, oil, when you, when you look at beginning to end of, of, of what it takes to make a Prius and put it on the road and maintain it, you're actually spending more in terms of energy uh, than you are on a Hummer, okay? So, I mean, that's the reality. You know, electric cars, I love them, you know, particularly, you know, if you could get something like a, you know, a Tesla going. But even the little Mitsubishi iMeV, I-M-I-E-V, uh, is a great little neighborhood car. No pollution, what have you, you know, all electric. But that energy has to come from someplace. You want to know where the energy comes from, go to West Virginia and look at those mountainsides, you know, that have been, that have been stripped. So... What are we looking at in 10 years? We're looking at, to me, uh, a, a matrix or, or, or a combination of things. You're looking at uh, electric, gas electric. I'm, I'm hoping you're looking at more intelligent use of compressed natural gas uh, you know, and propane. Uh, but you're probably still looking at a majority uh, market of, um, of, of fossil fuels. Uh, a more intelligent use of those fossil fuels, you know, direct injection, uh, gasoline and you know diesel engines, you know computer controlled uh, gasoline and diesel engines, um, you know lighter weight materials and that and that sort of thing. Uh, there's no silver bullet out there. Uh, if you want a silver bullet and you want to scare people, you know why not nuclear? <laughs> I mean why not? It works. I mean you know you you you, you go you, you go all over France. Uh, I mean a lot of the electricity is nuclear powered, you know, uh, electricity and, 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 and it works, you know, why not put it in a car? I oh, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to yeah. the days uh, in this personal stuff here when you were seventh grade and you started writing Governor Jimmy Davis, the singing governor, oh. the so-called author of You Are My Sunshine. Yeah. Uh, what was it in your life in Louisiana, in the Ninth Ward, that moved you to write Governor Davis? Uh, the, the public schools in New Orleans were being integrated, you know, at that time. Uh, and as punishment uh, for, uh, you know, the federal government saying the schools had to be integrated, the governor stopped paying black school teachers. He stopped, you know, he basically kind of like shut down pay the school teachers, you know, particularly black school teachers. Why? I wish I could. I, I, I never had the opportunity to, to ask him. Well, he came from a, he was poor as uh, Thank you. As you could be when he started. I, I, I just thought it was just racial spite. Uh, it was just, I, I, I never could understand that. What, was he playing for votes? Is that what? It, I think he was playing for votes, yeah, uh, probably. It was, it was, you know, strictly political. He obviously wasn't caring about 
black school teachers. He obviously wasn't caring about my father, who was a very proud man. Uh, and this was right around Christmas, as I recall. Um, and uh, my father is a very proud man. Very, very, very proud man. Is he still alive? I uh, know. He, he, he died uh, about maybe uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and he was not a person, you know, to ask for handouts. I mean, were he GM, he probably just would have gone bankrupt. <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, I could see the pain and the hurt in his eyes. And I knew that he wouldn't say anything about it. So I took it upon myself to write Governor Davis, you know, a nasty letter calling him a racist and a bunch of other things and uh, telling him how he was hurting our family with his stupid policy and stuff like that. Uh, the mistake I made was I mailed the letter without letting my father read it first. <laughs> and he said, are you trying to get us killed? Are you crazy? What's the matter with you? Don't you understand how the real world operates? Not not, <laughs> but he was also proud. Uh, he did, was, he, did you ever get an answer? Uh, from Governor Davis? Yeah. No, no. I never got an answer from him or any of his cronies. Uh, no. Here's a column that you wrote in July of 2007. I just want to read this first paragraph. Mm -hmm. I've often been accused of stridency, of thumping my chest and shouting, I'm right. The charges come from spouse and children, friends and acquaintances, and from more than a few of my fine editors at the Washington Post, one of whom wondered about my affection for diatribe. <laughs> Was that admitting too much? Probably. <laughs> it's the truth. I don't know whether you remember that column. But yeah, yeah, yeah. What led to you starting a column? Well, like because that? I probably went into another diatribe <laughs> and beat somebody up. I forget who I beat up in that column, but it was probably, it was a diatribe prelude to a diatribe. Yeah, yeah. Is that you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um, that, that I say both with pride and contrition. That's me. <laughs> why with pride and why with contrition? Uh, because I've often been accused of opening my mouth when I should have kept it shut. Uh, and I stand guilty. Uh, and, you, you know, sometimes with contrition because maybe sometimes I should have kept it shut. Uh, but as they say in the Catholic Church, it's a hell of a lot easier to get forgiveness than it has to get permission. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, in your book, uh, you dedicate the book to a lot of women. Yeah, yeah. And your son. Yeah. Uh, how many kids you got? Three, uh, three kids, uh, two daughters and my son. And what are they doing in their lives? Well, uh, the girls are okay. The girls are, uh, you know, the oldest girl, Benta, she's a partner with Kirkland and Ellis Law Firm. Uh, Kafi uh, is a, a chief medical correspondent for New York One. My son has uh, chronic epilepsy uh, and a lot of brain damage as a result of that, and so we're trying to work with him to get him into uh, an independent uh, uh, living program uh, so that he can have more of a life for himself, yeah. And your wife, Mary Ann, she gave you that kidney back in the late 90s? Yeah, she gave me my first kidney back in 1998, yeah. It's yeah. 19... I think it was 1998, the first one. 98. Yeah. Uh, what impact did that have on her giving up a kidney? You know, she's a funny woman. Uh, she was very, very happy, as a matter of fact, insistent on, on, on giving me her kidney. Regardless of the pain or medical inconvenience or anything it would cost her, it didn't, it didn't cross her mind, you know. She loves me, here's my kidney, take it. The impact was on losing the kidney. I never saw anyone so devastated. She was absolutely devastated uh, that her transplant only lasted for two years or so. I mean, she was depressed, you know, for a long time. After you, after it didn't work. After, you know, it, it worked for two years and then it stopped working. Uh, the, the hardest time in my life was coming home and telling Mary Ann that I was losing her kidney. Because I knew how devastating that would be to her. And it was, it was devastating, you know, for her. Uh, it told me a lot about her. Um, you know, so 
And then she was funny because there were several other women, women friends who were going to give, uh, give me a kidney. Uh, one I can't mention because she's, uh, 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 I can't mention it by name because she's uh, uh, an, an official with the you know, Organization of American States. At any rate, she's from Chile, so she'll know who she is. And so she's, you know, uh, she's in our kitchen, you know, with Marianne, and they're cooking something. Here. And uh, Marianne turns to Lydia, I just see the first name, and says, you know, Lydia, uh, I'm really happy that you are giving Warren, you know, your kidney. She says, oh, Marianne, not to worry about it. No, if that's okay, you know, Warren is my friend, and you know, I love Warren, blah, 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 blah. And then, Lydia, you do understand that your kidney is all you're getting for. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what about the impact on Martha McNeil Hamilton uh, when the second kidney then failed? Well, he, you know, Martha is one of you know God's children, uh, really, truly. Um, Martha's kidney was was like this. Um, uh, Martha and I were working together for at least you know a couple of years after she gave me her kidney, and it was like having a second wife, you know, in in the office. You know, I I go out to lunch. What are you going to eat? <laughs> Where are you going to eat? <laughs> what are you going to drink? You can't have any of that, you know, because you have part of me in you. And and I, honestly, I took that seriously. Uh, you know, when somebody gives you. Uh, physically a part of themselves like that. They're doing more than giving you physically a part of themselves. The recipient has a moral obligation to live up to that. Uh, the recipient has a moral obligation to do everything in his or her power to take care, you know, of, you know, of, of their gift. And so uh, that was another part of, of helping me to grow up, you know, understanding uh, but not only did Marianne, not only did Martha uh, give me a physical part of themselves, they give me something else of themselves, and I owe them. Uh, and it's not owe as in a dunning note. Uh, it's owe as in I have to return that gift of love with how I behave uh, and how I take, you know, take care of myself. So um, to people who are receiving you know, the gift of a transplant. You know, the one thing I wish they would understand uh, is that it is far different from receiving a car part. You know, I mean, it's not like changing a filter. You are receiving a part of a life, be that life uh, now snuffed out and you're getting uh, uh, a, a cadaver, uh, you know, transplant, or if, that, uh, or if it's a living transplant. You are receiving a part of a life. And as a recipient, you have to honor those people with how you live. And that's, uh, that's very real to me. Yeah, another interesting note in the book that uh, when you're at end of life uh, renal failure, that Medicare has to pay for it or they will pay for it at well, any time? Well, it's a complicated thing, and the insurance companies are going through it with me right now. Uh, you know, all of the insurers want to know, well, how long have you been on dialysis? Because apparently, I guess after a year or so, uh, your private insurance company uh, uh, cuts off and Medicare takes over. I think even, even if you're not 65. Even if you're not 65, and doesn't matter how rich you are or what you are doing. As all of this hypocritical talk, we talk about uh, a public health care plan. Well, I am on a public health care plan. Everyone, and not everyone, but certainly I would say 95% of the people who are receiving dialysis, and I think you're looking at a lot, oh, uh, 40,000, I think, and I should, I should stay away from numbers. But 95% of the people who are on dialysis right now are on a federal health care program. You know, uh, I go to dialysis uh, three days a week, three and a half hours per session. That's $800 per session. Medicare, for the most part, pays that or will be paying it uh, once my private insurance you know, you know, runs out. Uh, you have numerous other people who are not nearly as fortunate as I am to have uh, an employer like the Washington Post, uh, uh, you know, to have, you know, fairly, you know, we're not rich, but, you know, we're not by any stretch of the imagination poor. 
Uh, we, we, we're Obama rich, <laughs> under $250,000. Uh, um, uh, you know, who have private insurance or have uh, em employment that would take care of private. M most of the people I, I'm willing to hazard who are on um, dialysis, you know, today are funded by the federal government. Uh, and I doubt seriously that you'll find one of them who says, I don't want the federal government, you know, paying for this because without it, we die. You know, I mean, it's now become dialysis is now routine. It is so routine that you can just basically schedule your life around it. You know, but without it, you die. <laughs> what, what you mentioned earlier that uh, you're thinking about updating this book. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you want to do? Well, the question that is frequently uh, asked me by, um, I was kind of the, uh, <laughs> kind of a poster child for uh, uh, kidney transplants is, are you cured? And my answer is, no, you're not cured. Uh, if you read the Bible, you remember that Lazarus eventually died. <laughs> and so will I. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the question is, you know, what happens after the transplant, you know, doesn't work out? Uh, do you hang your head and, and feel, uh, you know, bad about it? Or, or how do you think about it? And how I think about it and what I want to write about uh, is that you have to look at every moment, particularly every gift of love, as an ultimate gift. I've had two major gifts of love. Uh, and it uh, extended you know, my life. Uh, and it's, it's extending my life now. Uh, the question is, what do you do with the extension? Uh, you, you know, how do you use the extension to make a difference? Uh, if it's just an extension and you don't make a difference, then what value is the extension? And so I want to write about that uh, uh, in the next book. And I may do it with Martha if she's willing. Uh, uh, and um, if not, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to do it alone. But I, but I hope I can do it with Martha. Yeah. Warren Brown has been our guest. His book is Black and White and Red All Over with Martha McNeil Hamilton. It's 2002, I believe. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and you can still get it, I assume. Yeah, you can still get it on Amazon, and you can still, uh, uh, well, you can certainly still get it on Amazon. Yeah. Thanks you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.